Hey folks, welcome back to Dominique Does Life. It's your girl Dominique back here with you. If you can't tell right now, I did have to reschedule this morning because I lost my voice and I'm still just uh, kind of getting it back. So please bear with me on that. If I sound a little different, that's why. Uh, we're going to review the final Suki Stackhouse book today. I know, final Suki Stackhouse book. You guys, have, you guys have been with me since springtime. I appreciate you. And now we are over and done with Suki Stackhouse and moving on to the next journey. Although I probably will review um, the collect uh, some of the collections of short stories in the Suki verse for you guys. But do let me know what books do you want me to recap and review uh, next. I'll be happy to do that. So Dead Ever After, and that now very quickly, very quickly, uh, I do want to say that there's a lot of um, hate, <laughs> let's say, uh, put toward Dead Ever After. Like, a lot of people are just not feeling it. A lot of people are just simply not feeling Dead Ever After. Okay. So, bear with me on that. If you hated it, if you hated it, that's okay. You're welcome to do that. I am certainly not going to tell you what to feel about it. I'm just going to let y'all know kind of what I felt about it, okay? That's all we're going to do. So, uh, I, for I forgot last time. When I was on last week, I totally forgot to give you guys my actual score of the previous book. Hi. Common sense knocking. So, I've been reviewing plot, character development, setting, narrative flow, style, and editing for a total score, a total possible score of 30 points, 5 points in each of those broken down areas of what I think should go into a good or even a decent book. So let's quickly touch on the last book and, and go over that. Okay, so the last book I would give maybe like a 4 out of 5 on the plot. I would give probably, again, a four out of five on character development. I would give five out of five, of course, on setting. On narrative flow, I would, I would probably give four out of five. We did talk about there being a little bit of clunkiness in the, in the previous book. Style, well, let's give it a five out of five. And then editing, meh. We'll give it a four out of five, okay? So that would be four fours and one five. I'm sorry, and two fives. Ah, hello. I can count. So that's only about 26 out of 30 points. Uh, the one prior to that, Dead Reckoning, I believe actually got 27 and some of the, or I'm sorry, 28 out of 30. And some of the other ones I gave a, a much better score to. So yeah, be, be ready for one that might not be uh, quite as solid this time around as well with regard to dead to ever after. Okay. So let's get in really quick to a spoiler free recap of what happened in dead ever after. So this, as I've mentioned to you guys, I can't always do a write-up on these as well as a podcast because they are convoluted. Like, there, there's a lot that's been squished and pushed into the last couple of books. And while I appreciate Charlene Harris doing her best to sort of tie up loose ends, it's very, it's, it can be difficult to get through. Look, it can be a difficult read. It can be a difficult read. So the book begins, it starts out here um, you know, quite a while, like a few months maybe before the actual plot points of the final book, probably just shortly, like let's say that this starts out shortly after Dead Reckoning ends, okay, so they give a little bit of a glimpse of what 
some of the main characters have been up to. And these main characters are only main characters in this book, not necessarily main characters in the whole series. So basically there are, I'm trying to think, three people who have a plan to take Suki down. And then there are two other people who feel wronged by Suki, despite the fact that she really hasn't done anything to make them feel that way. They just don't really want to take responsibility for their problems. And, uh, you know, the hand that they've had in creating those problems. And so they want to blame things on Suki. Well, they go to a supernatural authority. They go to a devil, not the devil, apparently, via Amelia, but a devil. And Mr. Catalides, Amelia and Mr. Catalides give a little bit more insight to this in the book. Want a devil to quote unquote help them with their plans. Well, Suki has used up her cluvial door in the previous book, so nobody can get their hands on that. Apparently, that was something that some of these people wanted, that some of these individuals intent wanted. We're not going to call the bad guys people in this book, but uh, basically, what Suki has happened to her in this book probably wouldn't happen the same way if she were involved with the vampires to the extent that she has been in previous books. So without trying to ruin or spoil anything, Eric has literally an engagement that he has had made for him that he has to take care of. And he's forced to take care of that engagement and to essentially cut ties with Suki. And Pam sticks around. Pam ends up stepping up into a leadership role in this book and afterward, I would assume. And so does Bill. And one of Eric's children comes, Karen the Slaughterer, <laughs> named after the author Karen Slaughter, who Charlene Harris, whom Charlene Harris quite enjoys. So Karen the Slaughterer is one of Eric's children. She, Bill, and Pam end up kind of closing ranks around Suki to protect her. But Suki doesn't have the deep involvement that she once had with the vampire world. So when some of the stuff goes down, she's left kind of in the lurch. So Arlene is let out of jail. As you know, Arlene was put in jail a few books ago. I'm not going to go into why if you haven't read those books. But Arlene was put into jail. She was locked up. Some of these villains, the three main villains I told you about just a moment ago, get her out of jail. Okay, they take her completely out of jail. And they want her to be part of a plan to undermine Suki. Which, while Arlene feels bad about that, to some extent, Arlene still does somewhat readily engage in this plan. The plan involves, and again, I'm being cagey about this on purpose. I'm trying not to spoil anybody's read. The plan involves a murder that takes place at either at Merlot's or that the body is dumped in Merlot's. And Suki's accused of this murder. Like, Suki is flat out accused of this murder and taken to jail. Well, because her vampire connections have been slightly cut back or actually quite a bit cut back, uh, she doesn't have the help from them that she once did. Although, who's to say that if one of the main characters hadn't intervened, one of her friends hadn't intervened, because apparently Suki's bank account is on hold as well. Like, that's obviously planned, that that happened at the same time that she went to jail and couldn't pay, couldn't pay her uh, bail. But one of the main characters intervenes to make sure her bail is paid. I happen to think that if that person hadn't intervened, probably Eric would have found a way to pay her bail, no matter what, because I think Eric always is going to love Suki, no matter where their relationship does or does not go, right? 
So Eric ends up fronting this main character the money for bail because the main character asked Eric before Eric could do it himself, which may or may not have been the smartest move. Uh, Sookie gets out after a day because of that bail, and then she's able to pay Eric back and get this other main character kind of out of debt with Eric, basically, once her finances are straightened out. Thankfully, some friends come out to help Sookie out, El Cid. Everybody shows up at her court hearing, like literally everyone shows up. All of her friends are like, "Uh uh-uh, Sookie didn't kill anybody, get her out of here. And unfortunately, one of the people who has like a real vendetta against her in this book is Elsie Beck, the dirty dealing detective. Alliteration, dirty dealing detective. So Elsie Beck has had her locked away and is kind of off on a on a tangent, off on like a vendetta, if you will, against Suki. And he always sort of has been, but like now it's ramped up. And there's a reason for that. There's a charm that's been placed on him. And Suki finds out that, it, that the charm might be in Elsie Beck's car, that there's some sort of like a mojo bag or something basically in there. And so Suki warns Andy to check Elsie's car or get Elsie to check his car and you know, get rid of whatever this charm is. Well, it, it ends up that later in the in the book they actually do this, and yes, that charm was affecting Elsie to dislike Suki more than he once had done originally. So, it is definitely something Elsie does grudgingly, but with the insistence of his wife Barbara and Mister Catalides and Andy and Suki and some others he finally does find this charm and they they end up destroying that charm and, and that sort of mojo bag, like I said, if you will, and uh, making sure that he's operating with a clear head. So Suki is cleared of all of these charges eventually. That That's not like the big mystery in this book. It's just a sort of a clue to the bigger mystery. So I don't feel like I'm spoiling anything with that. It's really, it's, I think it's like on the back of the book that this happens. So yeah, I mean, if you've read the back of the book, you're not going to be surprised if you haven't. I mean, like, I don't know why you haven't done that. Like I do that with all of my books. I read the description first uh, and even the reviews. But basically, I'm trying to, again, I'm trying to make sure that I don't spoil anything here. Basically, you can tell that a lot of people are after Suki. Well, Suki gets home, gets out of jail, gets out of lockup, and <clears throat> she notices earlier on that Sam's having trouble dealing with the events of what happened in the previous book. Well, he kind of gets over that and gets past that. Suki shows up at his house, ta- his mom's visiting to help him, talks to his mom. You know, it looks like things are on the mend with them. But then all of a sudden, Sam starts being really cold again, and she doesn't understand why. Well, that plays into Suki being in jail and Sam wanting to help her and not knowing how to do it. Sam has basically been bribed by someone to not help Suki out, or at least to not let Suki know that he's helping her out from the background. Again, Suki figures this situation out and straightens that out and ends up renewing her friendship with Sam, perhaps there's even more of a relationship going on there. You know what? I'm not going to lie. She ends up with Sam. Everybody knows this. And that, again, is not something that if you've read any of the other books or even, I don't know, read the back of any of the books, again, you're probably going to realize that she's ended up with Sam. Not a surprise. This is something that the entire series has been building to. And again, not part of the major mystery. So Sam and Suki do get together. I think Sam's a little bitch a lot of the time. I think he has grown as a person, but I also think that he's like, here's my issue with Sam, okay? He's preachy, he's judgy, and like Suki can be, but at the same time, usually you're on the same page with her. You're like, yeah, that person was being a jerk. What do you, of course, 
that person's a jerk. Yeah, like, we think so, too. But with Sam, like, he'll, like, chastise Sookie for stuff. Like, she's a little girl or, like, she's his kid or something. And it's always stuff that, like, doesn't make sense or that she... And then Charlene Harris seems to want to spin it like, oh, no, see, yeah, Sookie deserved to be uh, chastised for that minor thing. It's like, not really. I mean, it's not appropriate. That's that's not okay. And then Sam, oh, she's always talking about Sam having his pride be wounded. I'm like, does Sam have, like, small man complex or something? Like, I don't understand. Is Sam just really little and, like, a feisty little yappy dog, basically? Like, I don't know. I mean, I know he's a shifter, but does he literally shift into, like, a shih tzu or something and go, bow, 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 bow. look how big I am, bow, bow. Anyway, <laughs> I don't care for Sam. And I don't, like, I got that Charlene Harris is moving toward that pairing, like, for a long time, but I don't like it. Um, and I don't like how things sort of end with Sookie and Eric, although I do agree that Eric is pragmatic and he would be one who would value kind of doing his duty. Like, he's a very old school individual, of course course he's going to value doing what he sees as his duty over love or over you know a relationship with a human and of course he's going to be looking at things from a bit of a different perspective right of course he's going to be looking at things from like a long game longer term perspective he knows that human life is fleeting especially compared to the life of a vampire gosh she's over a thousand years old so he's gonna live to be a tenth of that if she's lucky right like it's a no-brainer that of course he thought about turning her like that should not be something Suki's surprised about frankly it shouldn't i'm sorry like I, I agree with her that like consent is really important and charlene harris does discuss consent when Eric and Suki end up having a conversation about this, about Eric basically saying, <clears throat> excuse me, losing my voice here a little bit again, but um, Eric basically says like, yes, I thought of turning you without your permission. Of course I thought about doing that. And Suki was like, oh my God, you thought about it? Well, he didn't like get caught trying and it's probably true that it may have just been a matter of time, but Suggy, like, you really expect that he's not going to at least think about it or consider it? He's pragmatic, and of course he's looking toward the future. Like, of course he is. Isn't that what you wanted in your relationship? Uh, both of you able to look toward the future? Like, I don't get it. And he hasn't done it, and he hasn't tried to do it, and he hasn't telegraphed an urge to try to do it. So I'm not quite sure why she's so ridiculously surprised when he mentions uh, one day that, yeah, he, that's crossed his mind. Yeah, I color me surprised on that one. I, I have to say that I do think consent is obviously the most important thing, whether we're talking about fiction or real life. But I, I can't imagine why Suki would be like completely surprised that that has crossed his mind. I think that is a little silly. That is a little much. Um, Suki ends up really strengthening and deepening her friendship with Bill in this one. And she ends up finding out that Copley Carmichael and his uh, driver have made a deal with a devil, again, not the devil, but a devil, and that they have lost their souls. They've willingly given up their souls in so doing, and they're causing some trouble because of that. And Mr. Catalides, Diantha, Amelia, and Bob, which, yay, I'm so glad that they're back, and uh, who else? Elseed, very briefly, but Quinn, who, again, is one of my favorite, all-time favorite characters in this universe, all come to help Sookie. They come to stay with her and to help her. And Barry shows up. Barry Bellboy shows up, who apparently is a relative of Mr. Catility's. 
hmm, wonder where he might have gotten that telepathy, hint, hint. But uh, they all show up, and Amelia explains about there being more than one devil, and Mr. Catalides explains about having seen Copley Carmichael in New Orleans, basically making a deal with the devil and meeting with the devil. And <clears throat> Tyrese says bodyguard has clearly has done the same thing. So once their souls are gone, they start making really poor decisions and they end up causing a real problem for Amelia and for Suki. Now in this book, Amelia is pregnant. She doesn't even know when Suki finds out. So Suki suspects that if she can sense the presence of the baby, it is going to be a really powerful witch. If she can sense the presence of the baby and the baby's quote-unquote brain, its consciousness, its soul, whatever you want to, however you want to phrase that, just a few days into her being pregnant, she's like, well, this is going to be a really powerful baby, a powerful witch. And she tells Amelia, thinking that Amelia already knows, she's like, well, don't, she says something along the lines of, well, don't you want to be downstairs by the bathroom? You might have to use the bathroom more often, and you probably don't want to trek up and down the stairs while you're pregnant. And Amelia's like, what are you talking about? And Suki was like, oh God, I'm so sorry. I thought you knew. Uh, but Amelia had only been around a few minutes, and Suki really didn't know if she knew for sure. But you would think that a powerful witch like Amelia and one like Bob as well would probably know that they were expecting a baby. But they don't, and Suki informs them. And unfortunately, uh, while they're all there, Copley Carmichael, Amelia's father, and his bodyguard caused some trouble. Part of that trouble being um, like a mass shooting. Bob is shot and Suki is shot, and, and I believe Barry is also shot before Mustafa and Warren come through and break up the situation and take out Tyrese Marley, who is uh, Copley Carmichael's assistant slash driver. Well, that's one of them down, but Copley Carmichael's still out there. Later on, the situation with him ends up being resolved and Amelia is basically able to take her father into her custody and decide what to what to do with them because she doesn't think that soulless people should be out roaming free causing havoc either and he clearly willingly gave up his soul as did his bodyguard uh, which was clearly not a very good move, but it's good to see Amelia become the one who's finally in the power position in that dynamic with her father. It's been a long time coming. And with Suki, I like that she gets to really strengthen her friendship with Quinn. I, I've always felt that Quinn was the best guy for her, and I thought that he was a great love interest. I didn't like that he was keeping secrets, of course, about his family, but, you know, but he, he's grown, so is she, um, and he really shows up for her in this book, and I like that Barry does the same thing, despite some of the struggles they've had in the previous books, it's, it's a very nice thing to read about, I, I like it a lot, and I have listened to the final book on audiobook, read by Joanna Parker, who is absolutely amazing, as as always. Just a truly fantastic audiobook reader. And, uh, let's see what else goes on here. I've got some notes here. Um, okay. Well, one of the things I will say is that despite what may happen between Eric and Suki, he tells her to quote-unquote never doubt his affection. And of course, that's a bit of a tepid response, but at the same time, he's letting her know, like, I'll always have affection and love for you. And I think that's really beautiful. I do. Now, Mr. Cataliades and Diantha are a huge, a huge help to Suki in this book. They show up for her in more ways than just one or two. 
And I will tell you this, that at the very end, Suki and Barry both find out through some physical uh, altercations, we'll say, who the real bad guys here are. I mentioned three bad guys a couple of times already throughout this podcast episode. Well, one of them is someone we know very well, and the other two are sort of uh, sort of like margin, side note, marginal bad guys that you will recognize. And I don't want to give it away, but you will recognize these people and their names and who they are and what they're about if you've read the other Sookie books. Um, trying to kind of cut through the minutia and see what else I need to talk to you guys about. Oh, uh, Jason and Michelle get married. Yay. I like Jason and Michelle together. They seem very happy together. So they end up getting, getting married and they go out with Suki and Sam for a night of dancing, which is fun, I suppose. And, hmm, what else have we got here? anything else oh yeah Suki does have that final confrontation with the three bad guys so you, again you will definitely recognize one you will probably also recognize the other two and you may or may not be surprised who the main bad guy is okay let's see what else happens oh of course Barry survives his physical altercation and ends up going to stay to recover with Sam's mom in Wright, Texas, where if you've read any of the uh, uh, novellas or the vignettes, you'll know that Wright, Texas is where Sam's brother got married amongst all of the demonstrating against wares after the wares and two nature came out. And hmm, I believe, I believe Amelia and Bob may go back to New Orleans. I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. And then of course, as I mentioned, um, Karen, Eric's other daughter and Pam, uh, end up sticking, sticking around for a while to sort of watch out for Suki. One of Eric's stipulations in his new contract, and I know I've been vague about that, but I don't want to ruin things for for everybody. One of the stipulations of Eric's contract is that he wants Karen to watch over Sookie's woods for a year, a full year. And then, of course, Amelia and Bob also put another protection spell up for Sookie, which is really lovely. And you know what? I think that I think it sort of ends with Suki saying, "Well, let's take it slow, but maybe we'll sort of make it official." Her and Sam in the next few months, which ugh, I don't know. Like I don't even know what that means. Uh, you know, I <laughs> while I want to say oh I'm I'm really sad that the story is over and really I guess I am sad that the story is over I don't think it was ended that well I usually am like sad that the story is over when I'm done with the series but I'm like well okay at least everything's tied together and it ended well and it's not tied together in a clunky way or in a forced way <clears throat> And so, with this one, I had trouble getting to that place. I felt like it was tied together in a clunky, enforced way. I think that Sam is just, again, like, it's almost like he's got small man syndrome. He's very, like, I don't know, like, his pride and his ego are, like, very prevalent throughout the series. And he almost, to me, seems like one of those, like, neckbeard, nice guy syndrome jerks from, like, I don't know, some corner of a subreddit in Reddit. Like, I don't know. He just seems very misanthropic, we'll say. 
<laughs> people wait and see. He seems like a bit of a misanthrope. He just seems un unlikable, in my opinion. Not that there aren't good things that he does, but like barging in and like being a jerk to her relatives and just like being jealous all the time and like calling her to task for things that he really has no business even speaking on. I think that's pretty awful. I think that he needs to do a lot more growing and a lot more learning. And I just think that the connection between them seems forced. And it's weird because in the first few books where they have these like lustful, if you will, which I don't like that word and I'm kind of sorry, I just used it, <laughs> moments, like it, it, even those didn't see com seem rather completely forced. But I don't know, there's something about like the development of their relationship, quote unquote, that just seems totally 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 forced and just it's like really sucky like you could have like it's basically like oh you could marry like a baller or like a politician or somebody who's equally awesome and successful or like I don't know um it, geez somebody who does something of note and is a decent human being in addition to that but you settled for this like small time like backwater bar owner who like barely keeps his head above water morally or financially like really I mean wow okay I guess he's supposed to be sort of a foil to Suki like he's supposed to be they're like two supposed to be like almost two sides of the same coin or their journey is parallel but I don't think that they do and maybe that was what Charlene Harris's original intent was, which I respect, but I, I think that she got so caught up in the descriptions of Suki and Eric and Suki and Bill and Suki and Quinn and even Suki and El Seed that she sort of lost the thread of what she maybe was trying to develop with Suki and Sam. And I just think that, Sam, like I say, Sam is just somebody that I as the reader, would have trouble being around. Like, I've had friends who are like Sam, who can't get a grip on their feelings for me that aren't returned, at least initially with Sucky and Sam. The feelings aren't returned, and, like, you know, he needs to chill out about that, basically. But, like, I've had that. I've been there. I think all people have been there, but especially women have been there and it's not cute. It's not, like, cute for the person to persist, right? It's not cute. You're not going, oh, maybe one day when we all learn our lessons and change for the better. No, that that's not going to happen. Like, I just think that somebody who has an ego as fragile as Sam's, what the hell business does he have with Suki? I don't even know you guys. Like, tell me if I'm off base, please. I, I don't think I am. But please tell me if I'm totally off base on this and just being a total hypocrite. But like I say, I don't think I am. I think that Suki and Sam are... <sighs> I just don't care. I don't care for them. I don't. I don't. Eventually, down the line, Pam does take over as sheriff of Area 5. So, yay for that. That's freaking awesome. That's absolutely awesome. I love Pam. Pam's one of my favorite characters. And I am kind of glad that despite the fact that Quinn is having a baby with Tycharine, the tigress that he's not in, like, a conventional relationship with her because Quinn needed to do some work on his own. Like, he didn't need to hop into another relationship. And he didn't need, he even need to try to get back with Suki. Like, he needed to just do things on his own. So I'm glad that he's doing his thing and, and he gets the extra added bonus of being a dad, which is cool. I really love Quinn. I think that Quinn seems like a responsible person and the kind of person that Suki might enjoy being with. Or, I mean, shoot, they could have introduced some other person that we weren't even expecting. But I just don't like Sam, you guys. I don't. Um, <clears throat> okay, that aside, that aside, 
Oh, and I've got to say really quick before I give the uh, total score on this one, I've got to say that I think that Suki and Sam have both demonstrated that they are not ready for relationships because of the way they've handled their previous ones. Now, Suki is getting there more so than Sam, but what the hell business do they have together? They both can't handle having a solid relationship. What the heck are they doing together? I don't get it. I really don't. Like, slamming doors and slamming car doors and hanging out phone calls and ignoring each other and yelling at each other when they're in relationships with other people. Like, that's how they're treating their partners, and yet somehow they're both ready to, like, jump right into a relationship together now? I I don't like it. And even though they're like, oh, we're, t- we're going to take it slow. No. No, I don't, I don't buy it. I don't, I think it was forced. I really do. And like I said, I think that Charlene Harris may have gotten lost in the description of Eric and Bill and some of the actual characters that mean a damn thing in the series and Quinn and El Cid, <clears throat> excuse me, then, you know, where, where she could have rather been spending time with Sam and developing him if she was going to, I guess I assume she was, maybe I shouldn't. But, yeah, it, I think that Sam's underwhelming. And I I wouldn't, you know, you've got to at least be able to see yourself making the, a similar decision to the main character, right? Like, okay, like, I can see why they ended up with this person. Maybe this person isn't my ideal, but if I were the character, yeah, that's the choice I probably would have made, too. All right, good on them. But I don't see that with Sucky. I'm like, really? Sam? Like, he's so, like, he's so petty and vindictive. And he's such a little bitch. I gotta say that one more time. Sam's a little bitch. (laughs) So, that's my last chance to say it. (laughs) At least until the vignettes are reviewed. But, yeah, I think Sam is just not the right person for a Sucky. And that Sucky just needs to take some time and just be on her own. And also, the fact that, like, everybody in her life seems to magically be on board with her, like, moving right on to Sam, I I don't get that. I mean, especially knowing, like, let's say, Amelia or Tara, knowing them the way that Charlene Harris has developed them as characters, right? You would think that they would be like, girl, take some time for yourself. Like, don't worry about none of this Sam nonsense. Like, just take some time for yourself and let Sam do the same. I mean, for Christ's sakes, he had a partner who died recently, like died, like really recently. And Suki's had a bunch of really awful, upsetting breakups and losses. Like, why are you jumping right in together? But okay, whatever, that's how she chose to end the series, it was underwhelming for me, although I do love, rather, visiting with the town of Bonton, and all the amazing personalities that live, live there and visit there, I just thought that was a real treat, and made the book worth it, you know, that was the, for me, that was the icing on the cake, I really could care less about Suki and Sam, so let's go for a total score here, plot, I'm going to get, a, get a, give it a 4 out of 5. Character development, 3 out of 5. Okay. Setting, 5 out of 5. Okay. Narrative flow, oh, 3 out of 5. Style, 4 out of 5. And then editing, three out of five. Eek, that is, let's see, what is, I totally just blanked on what that was. Okay, let's add that up. Ugh, hi, I know math. <laughs> oh, God, okay. Okay, four out of five for plot, so four. And then character development, we're going to do three, so that'll be seven. Setting, obviously, is a five, that's 12. 
Uh, da, 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 near to flow. Uh, three. So that's 15. Style. I think I decided on three. 18. Editing, three. That's, y'all, that's 21 out of 30. That's like a six point difference between this and dead reckoning. Not great. I'm going to tell you that. But we will be back for sure at some point to review the vignettes. You guys, let me know what series you want me to review next. And please feel free to weigh in um, on the live shows. Please feel free to weigh in on the live shows at Spreaker on the free Spreaker app or Spreaker.com at Dominique Does Life. Whenever I have a live show there, if you followed me on the free Spreaker app, you'll know that. It, I won't spam you, but I will give you one quick notification if you want to be part of the notification squad on that. I'll give you a quick notification when I go on the air. And I, if you follow me on my Dominique Does Life Facebook page, I will put up events as, and put up when I'll be planning on going on the air next. Okay. So please feel free to follow me at Dominique Does Life on the free Spreaker app. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. It will only take you a few seconds to download and to follow me on at Dominique Does Life. And then if you want to follow me on Facebook at Dominique Does Life, uh, like my page and you'll be notified when I put up an event and when I plan on going live so that you can weigh in and be part of the discussion. Let me know there or in the comment sections on Spreaker or any of the other distribution platforms you're hearing this episode on what other books or a series you'd like me to review. I do have a few that I've listed and that, I, that we've been talking about. Should I review them? Should I not? I'd love to review here are a couple of them. <clears throat> I'd, I'd totally love to review the J.D. Robb slash Nora Roberts in death series that features Eve Dallas and her husband Rourke. It's really kind of like a gritty uh, futuristic tr- uh, crime sort of series, which is very compelling and entertaining. But unfortunately, with all the vignettes and the novels, there are about 100 books. So I am only going to do that one if everybody's super on board with that. Or if you guys want me to do them sort of like one at a time, like a one off, then perhaps we'll do that. But I'm not going to be stuck on one series for like seven years. I'm like old and sitting uh, in a rocking chair in the rest home like, okay, book 57 of the Eve Dallas series in death by J.D. Robb. <laughs> when like podcasting is no longer a relevant platform and, uh, you know, global warming has like tornadoes swarming all around the nursing home that I'm in. <laughs> like, no, we don't want to do that. Okay. That's not what I, that's not my idea of hijinks. I love you guys, but no. So unless everybody really wants me to get on doing the In Death series, the Eve Dallas series by J.D. Robb slash Nora Roberts, then I'm going to stray away from that. But again, if you guys are super into that, let me know. Another one I was thinking of is Philip Pullman, His Dark Materials. It's a really excellent three book series. I feel like lots of people have done like C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, but I think the Pullman, the Pullman series, the His Dark Materials trilogy, you know, especially with the HBO show, might be an interesting uh, series to do. And I'm also thinking, let's see, oh, the Percy Jackson books, the Harry Potter books. I know that's pretty rote. That's been done. I do Twilight, but I know that's been done. Um, but yeah, the Harry Potter series I would do, I, gosh, let's see, what other books do I absolutely love? I, I do love the Percy Jackson books. Uh, I like a lot of things other than just fantasy. That's just kind of what is coming to my mind right now. I would do the Janet Ivanovich books. However, I realize that most of her books now are being written by a ghostwriter, and I don't know that I want to bother to evaluate a ghostwriter's books. I could do some of the Sherlock Holmes stories. I could do Tom Clancy. I don't know, maybe The Hunt for Red October as far as a standalone book. I could do some of the Clive Cussler books. 
although again he's written by a ghostwriter but yeah I, I think his work is decent I mean, we could do that I could review Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's take on the Sherlock Holmes world Mycroft and Sherlock I could even review some of David Sedaris's books of essays like you guys let me know what you want me to review oh some other good ones that I have read recently uh, and I'm trying to recall the name of the author I've got to look it up so please forgive me for that but um, ba, 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 ba. oh I, I recently read Brad Meltzer The First Conspiracy I read Lincoln and the Bardo by George Saunders uh, and there were a couple of books I read by Madeline Miller that were I believe yeah, Circe was one of them, and there was another one they, that I read. I can't remember the title right now, but they are quite good, quite good books. I like Madeline Miller, and I don't know, David Baldacci is another actor. That, or actor. Yes, hi, I have words that make sense. Another author that I like and that I'd be willing to review, uh, Mary Janice Davidson, who is hilarious. I would totally review her books, her Undead and series. Uh, I would totally review Isaac Marion's books. I love Isaac Marion's books. And I'd redu review even, God, I do not have words today. I'd review any of the other Charlene Harris series and books. And another one I'd like to review at some point, just me personally, would be the Andy Weir book, The Martian. So you guys let me know what you want to hear. And again, you can join in on the reviews live. Like you can just weigh in live with your comments and we can start a discussion. And again, if you want to know when I'm planning on going live, follow me at Dominique Does Life on Facebook. If you want to be part of the notification squad, mount up join me on spreaker and follow me at dominique does life that's gonna do it folks hope you're well and have a beautiful beautiful day